Honey Dripper going, you know, and uh, it's, it's a story, it's not too long, but it is a story, and uh, I was playing with a band called the California Rhythm Rascals, uh, Sammy Franklin was the leader, and we played the Elks Ballroom every Sunday night up on Central Avenue, this was about, oh, 1941, 42, and uh, they had a dance coming out called the Texas Hop, see, and uh, we played a lot of stock arrangements, there was nothing in the book that fitted the Texas hop. So I'm thinking, well, gee whiz, if I could just write something that fit the Texas hop, see? And I got this little bass going, a little bass thing. Something like that, you know, an offbeat thing, you know. And uh, then I put a melody to it. Like that, see? And uh, so intermissions, I would start to play this thing doing intermissions. And the girls would gather around the piano, and, and the guys would grab them. They'd start doing this Texas hop, and every intermission. So uh, uh, the drummer in the band, he says, uh, uh, you play that little thing every intermission, says, says uh, so many pretty girls gather around. Say, so you're, you're a sweet man. He says, uh, so you, uh, you drip a lot of honey. He says, you're a honey dripper. That's what you're, a honey dripper, you know? And uh, so uh, I go home, and I'm thinking, Oh, I made an arrangement of this thing for the band. No words. I called it Cripple Joe because uh, I was playing Sandlot baseball and I slid into second base and messed up my right foot, see? And it, I was, so I was in a cast when I wrote this thing. And I was going like this. Like that. That's, that's the theme of it, see? And, uh, I tried to write, write words to Cripple Joe. I couldn't write a single word to Cripple Joe. So one day something says, well, why don't you mimic yourself? Says, you're a fat guy, and uh, you know, and they all think you, uh, you know, you're a mellow cat, the gals all like you. And I said, and said, call it the honey dripper. That's what they call you, see? So I says, honey dripper, da 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 da. The honey dripper. I said, that's it, that's it, see? So I went home in about 30 minutes. I wrote all these words. Boy, the honey dripper, you know. He's a killer, the honey dripper. Soft, sweet, hot, he's a solid old cat. Really a mellow hip fat, you know. He jumps and swings, he rips and rides, he gives and shouts, he's a hive of jive. So dig that cat and jump for joy. I got the hive of jive from Willie Jackson. See, Willie, uh, had something going, he used to wear, use this word hive of jive, see? So I got the hive of jive uh, little line there, uh, from, picked it up from Willie, you know? And I wrote this thing in five parts, five part song. So I went back to the band, wrote out, I wrote out uh, lyrics for everybody in the band. I said, now we're gonna stand up and sing this, then we'll sit down and play it, see? So uh, we, I kicked it off and we stood up, boy, and they clapped their hands, you know, doom, doom. The Honey Dripper, one of those things. And the thing, and then we sat down and played the arrangement that I'd made, see? And it was a smash. So uh, people started lining up, you know, to hear this, see? And he jumps and swings, he rips and rides, he gives and shouts, he's a high of jive, see? So uh, I went to Sam, I said, Sam, we got a hit. I says, uh, if you pay for the recording session, it's right $500. You pay for that, I'll give you half the song. He said, well, I gotta talk to Vera. So he went and talked to Vera, see? That's his wife. She worked at the General Hospital. She was a nurse out there. So he came back the next Sunday night. He said, well, Vera says, we can't do it. She says, we need a washing machine. We need a dryer. So we can't do it. I said, well, Sam, I'm gonna leave your band. I'm gonna form my own band, see? So I knew Willie Jackson. I think Willie's mother, she played a pretty big part in the Honey Drippers too. You know, she, she really encouraged us to keep on doing it. And we never could rehearse enough at her house. She loved the rehearsals, you know. And we formed the Honey Drippers and we started playing it. And that's where Willie Jackson came in playing his part. I'll show you what Willie, Willie, Willie play your part there, you know. <laughs> Oh, 
started playing this in clubs around town, around Los Angeles, and people would line up to hear this honey dripper. At this time, they had, uh, they had bombed Pearl Harbor. I mean, the Pearl Harbor thing, incident had happened. And uh, so we were at war, see? And uh, they had all the lights in the city had to go out at 12 o'clock. So we started playing this honey dripper at quarter to 12. And we'd play it from a quarter to 12 to 12 o'clock. It was long, you know. And uh, people were lining up two blocks to hear this. So a recording executive came down. And he said, I want to hear this honey dripper thing that everybody's talking about. See? I said, well, fine. So it was about 8 o'clock when he came. He sat there and he said, when are you going to play the honey dripper? I said, oh, we play that a quarter to 12. He said, well, I can't wait here till a quarter to 12. I said, well, if you want to hear honey dripper, you have to wait till a quarter to 12. So he sat there and he fumed you, but he sat there. And uh, we played so many, so many other tunes that we he recorded for him. He says, I'm glad I stayed because you guys have a lot of music. He says, who writes all this music? I said, well, I write it, you know. And when he heard this honey dripper, the crowd just, they were lined up two blocks. Nobody they couldn't, nearby could all get in that club, see. But it was just jammed, man. And when he heard this honey dripper, he came up and he said, look, Joe, said, you got someone to take you anywhere. He says, uh, you guys rehearse? I says, every day, you know. So he says, I'll be at rehearsal. I said, we rehearsed at Willie Jackson's house, and we rehearsed every day. So he was there. And uh, the only thing about the honey dripper was too long. He said, well, no, nowhere in the world to get 15 minutes on a three-minute record. See? I said, well, maybe we could use two sides of the record. And he said, well, how would you do what you I said, we call it part one, call it part two. Uh, you just let me know when three minutes are up. So he had his stopwatch, and we'll hit a long note, hold it right there, see? And uh, we did that, and then we went to the other side and played more of the Honey Dripper. And we worked it out that day, and uh, we got, got a right to cry. That was another tune we recorded for him. We uh, had the hit. That arrangement didn't have to be changed. And we went in the studio, and we, we were only there about 45 minutes. And uh, we cut, in fact, we cut five sides that day, Honey Dripper Part 1, Part 2. I left a good deal in Mobile, got your love in my heart and uh, Lover's Lament. We did five tunes that day. This was April 20th, 1945. And uh, Leon took this honey dripper to Silver's Drugstore on 54th and Central, about 8 o'clock the next morning. He put on the jukebox. He came back to see if it got any plays about 8 o'clock that night. So the guy said, well, that's all I've been playing. So, so he looked on the jukebox and it had played 135 times. So he knew he had a hit, see. So he went and borrowed some money at the mortgage of mother-in-law's house. I think they got about $5,000 from, from her. And they went and joined with a guy named Jack Gutschel. Jack put in about twenty grand. 
they opened up a distribution and uh, they sent honey drippers to everybody all across the country. Distributors, DJs, the whole bit, you know. Orders start pouring in and the honey dripper tied up every independent press in Los Angeles. For about two or three years, that's all they pressed was honey drippers. <laughs> it tied it up, you know. And so that's, uh, and it was number one for 26 straight weeks on the billboard chart, number one. Nobody could knock it off. They tried everything. Then the, the laugh was Sammy Franklin, he tried to record it after that, you know. <laughs> and uh, nobody could match our recording, see. One, one thing that helped us to get the sound was the baritone horn, uh, you know. But the, another way we had to, the way you had to write for the two horns, you had to be sure you kept the, what you call a color basic principle in on the, in the arrangements going at all times. You couldn't double uh, fifths, or you couldn't double and have no consecutive octaves. It had to be color basic all the time, see. And uh, this gave you the warm sound, also gave you the full sound when you had to put the piano in. Where there weren't horns, you made sure the piano filled that up and or the bass helped to help too, you see. So this, this gave us a pretty pretty good sound and it was neat. Everybody liked it. Say, hey, Willie, yeah. what really started you to play in saxophone anyway? That's, I'd like to know that myself. Well, I thought I wanted to play t a cornet because uh, Teddy Buckner was playing. I got him a cornet and he lived across the street from me. And, uh, oh, you knew Teddy? Yeah, I knew Teddy. Uh -huh. 1924, my mother bought me a I see me with the saxophone. Uh -huh. And man, I haven't put the horn down. I just changed the horn. I haven't put it down since. My, my, uh, I was supposed to be playing alto, and she didn't know, so she bought a C melody, and I traded it in for a baritone after uh -huh. a few years. Well, that's how you got the baritone, right? right. I see. We were about the only small band that had a baritone. My first interest with, with music, I was about, oh, I, I must have been around five. And uh, I distinctly remember hearing this band. See, we lived in, we lived behind a big red barn, and uh, it was on the white part of town. They had the white section and the black section. We lived in the white section of town behind a big red barn. And the main street, it must have been maybe a block, I don't know, when you're small, the block seems like a mile, you know? <laughs> but I heard this band, and I just took off like a jet. And uh, my mother missed me. She didn't know where I was. But I went up there, you know, and they had these horns where you slide out, they were, da, I didn't know what they were, you know. And uh, they were marching with those horns out in the front line, and these other horns were in the back. And there were elephants, you know, and oh, it was just fantastic. And I'm following all this music all the way out to the edge of town. Get out to the edge of town, all at once, everything stopped, boom. And all you could just see your horse's feet, plat, 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 and I'm lost. I don't know where I am. <laughs> I looked up and my, here comes my mother, and I never would forget, she had a white apron on. I was never so happy to see my mother. <laughs> I didn't know where I was. But that, that let me know what I really wanted to be. I wanted to be a musician, you know. Then later on, my mother started taking me to church. It was a sanctified church, but they had instruments. They played drums, and they played trumpets, and xylophones, and I couldn't wait to go to church, you know. And... Uh, then later on, uh, my mother was working for a lady, and uh, my mother would, kept telling her about me, that I wanted to be, play music, you know. So this lady was a concert pianist, and she had this Steinway. So uh, she had a terminal illness, and had to give up playing on the concerts. So she told my mother, says, you always talk about your little boy wanting to play the piano. I says, uh, I'm gonna let you buy this piano. She took a piano with her everywhere she went, her big Steinway, you know. My mother says, oh, I could never buy that. She said, yeah, Annie, you can buy it. She says, I'm going to sell it to you for nothing down and 50 cents a week. And says, and if when I pass, then the piano's yours. And my mother went out and she washed for this lady and ironed and so forth, you know. So my mother bought this piano. They brought it home, set it up, put the legs on, everything. When I went over and looked at that piano and saw those keys, those black keys and the white keys, I knew what they were going to sound like, because like, it looked like I could, there was a dividing thing, and it looked like you could hear the sound, like where the black keys were, then those three black ones, the two black ones, you know. So I hit these keys, and they sounded exactly like I thought they were going to sound. So I put a couple of them together, and, I, and that sounded good, and I put three of them together, and that was a chord. So I started playing right then. I started playing when the saints go marching in. 
dum, 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 you know, with the card. My mother said, my baby can play. <laughs> so she said, I'm going to take you to church. So I said, Mama, I don't want to go. Oh, yeah, you go in the church. So she took me to church, put me on the piano stool, and I sat there for eight years playing, <laughs> playing for the church. But I learned to play in every key because one lady would start out, you know, like, like they're doing the saints, you know. When the saints go marching in, and that'll be her key, you know. And then when she give up, this other lady go, oh, when the saints go marching in, she's at a different key. See? So I had to find all these keys, you know. And uh, over a period of time, I'm playing in every key on the piano, you know. Wasn't but 12. I didn't know there wasn't but 12, but there wasn't but 12. It seemed like to me it was 100. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what other kinds of music did you hear? Well, uh, leaving the church music, which I think had a, still has a profound influence on what I do with music, uh, the Duke Ellington Band. i never forget hearing the Duke Ellington Band. And I'd, I'd be outside shooting models or loading tires, and uh, the Duke Band would come on out of somebody's house. And I thought that was the greatest music in the world, this Duke Ellington music, you know. And then I'd hear Bessie Smith singing the blues and people like that, you know. I didn't know who they were at the time. But you heard a lot of blues coming out of these houses. And uh, my mother would never buy the records because they called them, they called them reels. They didn't call them records. They used to be round, you know, like a, like a cylinder. And you slide this cylinder on this old Victor thing, you slide the cylinder on the arm, and you just put the needle on the cylinder and as the cylinder spin around the needle would play the whatever was on the cylinder, you know. And they, they called them reels. And my, my mother said, don't bring none of them reels in here. <laughs> that was blues. Though. Yeah, that was blues, you know. Did you like blues? Oh, yeah, I, I liked it. I liked, I liked all. If it was music, I liked it. I got a horn when I was uh, about 11 years old in the band in, in Oklahoma. I started playing in the band. And uh, the instruments always fascinated me. So when I wrote a march when I was about 12, and I got every horn, and I'd figure out the part, just hearing the part in my ear. But I wrote it all down and uh, got it on each, each instrument, you know, and when they, when they played it, it sounded like it was arranged, you know. But I just did it all from hearing, hearing the parts, see. But when I came to California, then I started studying harmony in the school, and I started studying, I got me an arranging book, the Arthur Lang arranging book. I was working at the Creole Palace in San Diego and I got this arranging book, started writing for the bands, and uh, just learned arranging that way, see? Then when I was out to high school, I wrote the high school, wrote the class song, and I arranged that for the symphony orchestra. And uh, then I went out to college and started writing uh, the variety shows, things like that, and arranging that for the orchestra out there, see? So by the time I got, you know, out where I was making a living with music, I knew how to write, how to, write to arrange, and I was writing pretty good, you know. That's how that came about. Oh, about 17 or 18, I started trying to play the piano in small bands in San Diego. And I got in the band at the Creole Palace and uh, played, played there three years. They let me off, uh, that was a seven nights a week job, six hours a night, eight to two. They let me off one half and half of one night to go graduate from high school and to come right back. <laughs> When I got back, they had bought me a briefcase, and they had my name on it. Man, I'm, I walked out of there, I'm, I'm Professor so-and-so, you know, <laughs> with my own briefcase. <laughs> yeah. World War II had, a, had an impact on uh, especially economics of blacks. They were coming out of here from Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, places like that, because it was work. They could get jobs. They could feed their families. They could buy homes, you know, and uh, so this became the place. A lot of defense, defense plants, working people, hiring people. I went out to Douglas and got a job just like that, uh, running, running a lathe. So I ran tour lathe for a while, then I ran the straight lathe. And that was a little far from home, and I found another job just about oh, eight or ten blocks from where I lived. So I went up there and started working the lathe. It seemed like to me it was a... Uh, a uh, deal where this guy didn't want to work with the blacks, you know. And uh, in fact, so they, they dropped their aprons. It was not just one. They started walking when they hired this colored guys on the, on the defense line. Well, uh, they just dropped their aprons and walked off, you know. 
they didn't realize the significance of what they were doing. And this foreman, he went over, he says, now, uh, you know, we're into a war. We're trying to win a war. And uh, we're all Americans, you know. And so this man, he's contributing, just like you're contributing. And when you walk off from this machine or what you're walking off from, you're walking off from the war. You're walking off from your country, you know. And little by little, they just start walking back, one by one, came back and started working their machines. When I'm playing, when I'm running my machine, this machine going, tack a lack a lack a lack tack a lack tack I'm like, boy, tack a lack a lack a lack the honey dripper, clack a lack a lack a lack he's a killer, you know. <laughs> That's all I could hear, this machine making rhythm, you know, to my songs I'm singing, you know. And I had a ball working all day long, singing my songs against this machine's rhythm, see. So when, the, when they blew this horn that the war was over, man, I dropped my apron in the middle of the floor. <laughs> I says, I'm going. I got a band. I'm going. Our home spot was uh, the Downbeat on Central Avenue. Every time we came off a tour, we, we start winning the Downbeat. And we'd be in there maybe like six or eight weeks. And in the meantime, they'd be setting up tours and spots in other places. But uh, that was our home spot. And Roy Milton's home spot was across the street. Directly across the street was the last word. Then uh, adjacent to that was the Club Alabama. This was all on Central Avenue, see. And they had the Mimo Club. That was down the street a little further. Of course, they only had a pianist in the Mimo, but it was a popular spot because it was after hours, too, see. And uh, there was Jack's Basket up the street. That was a popular spot. We played Jack's Basket a few times, and uh, that was after hours. The main thing I remember about Jack's Basket was a good fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> they had some fried chicken, man, it was out of sight. And those biscuits would just float up to you. You didn't have to, they were so light, they just, you reach and get one, it just floats up on the way. And it floats right up to you, you know? <laughs> Country blues had an influence on rhythm and blues because that's what you heard, you know. When you were down in Oklahoma, you heard all this country music. Uh, you heard the blues. and uh, But it wasn't rhythm and blues. It was just more or less blues, singing about your troubles, and singing about your girl, you know, your sweetheart, and even singing about hard times, see? They sung about everything. It was more like folk music. And of course, when they come to California, they, you bring your music along with you, see? And I don't know, when, in my case, uh, I've always felt like rhythm should be a part of it, you know? So when I started writing, I just write, I might have been writing songs like maybe they were singing, I like to arrange, you know, and so my arranging had an influence on, on what I wrote. And uh, I, I like the sound of a big band, so I'm trying to get my big band sound into what I'm writing, see. So I like to add the city influence into it. And what you learn in school, you put that in. You just incorporate it, you know. So uh, that's way that's way I did mine. And uh, even the Roy Milton band, it was influenced, something like that. Roy didn't write, but he... You know, he had people in the band that, that uh, helped to write and create. I think he was one of the, had one of the influences on West Coast rhythm and blues, see. They give Roy Milton and Joe Liggins credit for kicking off West Coast rhythm and blues. See, I started recording with uh, uh, Leon Rene, who had uh, exclusive records. And Leon, he always told me that uh, it's better to be a big fish in a little pond. He says, because we... If you're the big fish, then we have put everything we got behind you, see? So uh, I went along with that, and uh, we, I was a big fish over in his little pond, see? So he got, gave a lot of push. But we weren't selling any records in uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, those Washington, D.C., that area, see? And the New England states. So, uh, <clears throat> but when we went back there, we were so popular until uh, the Apollo Theater allowed us to play the night before we open. And usually it's 30 days before or 30 days after you can't play in the area of the Apollo within 50 miles, see? But they allowed us to come in and play the day before, the night before. We played the Renaissance Ballroom, open the next day at the Apollo to just mammoth crowds, see? And all this was due to the popularity of the records, which we, we weren't selling. We had to sell a single record back there, but everybody had them, see? And what was happening was uh, the gangsters, the syndicate, they had their own press. They were up in the Catskill Mountains. They were pressing honey drippers by the thousands. And they were flooding all this 
area, New England states and New York state and all the way down to Pennsylvania. They were flooding everything. So Leon uh, went back there to check this out. He wanted to go talk to these guys. And the office was up at the Catskill, so he started up there and they met him at the bottom of the mountain with a submachine gun, told him he couldn't go any further. He said, well, I'm Leon Rene. I'm Exclusive Records. He said, we don't care who you are, you know? So, so Leon, he became very disturbed and he opened up a distribution there in New York. But it flopped. They had it, they had it all sold up. He couldn't distribute a single record. So he spent over $100,000 trying to get a foothold, but he couldn't, couldn't buck them, you know. So uh, that gives you an idea of, of if they want to move in on you, they can, you know. And, uh, but the independent companies, they were really the uh, catalyst for small bands like my band, even the uh, Johnny Otis band, Roy Milton band, a lot of the, the smaller bands. We grab companies like uh, Modern, Aladdin, Savoy, Exclusive, Excelsior. Those were all independent companies. And they grabbed these little guys and they were cleaning up, you know. Because the big companies, they had the big boys, you know. And, and if you weren't a Bing Crosby uh, and that Cole or somebody, you know, they didn't want to bother with you. But this was an entirely new field, man. It just loaded with potential. I remember Leon went to Sears, Roebuck. And to get my record on in the Sears, and they had they weren't handling any black records, so Leon said, "Well, they said well, we are getting some calls for a record called I Got a Right to Cry." So he said, "Well, that's Joe Liggins." He says, "I have I have that one, see." So they said, "We'll stock that Sears." So Sears started stocking, "I Got a Right to Cry." Then they started asking for, well, "If you got that, you must have the Honey Dripper." So the Sears started stocking the Honey Dripper. Then they just gradually went on into stocking black records. But at first they were stocking no black records. I toured for, well, about seven or eight years with the original band. We'd play average about, uh, about 101 nighters a, a year. And then we'd play theaters and clubs. We'd always do about a month or five weeks of theaters, like the Apollo in New York. We'd play the Adams in Newark, New Jersey. We play the Howard Theater in Washington, D.C. Play the Royal Theater in Baltimore, Maryland. Then I started playing the Bijou Circuit. That was down south, where you'd play Lexington, Louisville, Nashville, like that, see? What was that touring down south? Atlanta. Yeah, that was during it. We'd mix that in with the tour down south, see? Those theaters were mostly like three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, see? What was you'd that like, the experience? Oh, it was uh, it was mixed, a mixed thing. Some places I'd have to get out of the car and, and go get food for the guys because you couldn't eat inside. And you'd go up to the window and uh, I'd, the guys didn't want to go, so I just, I'd go, you know, and say, well, can I get, I have a band out here and we need some food and we need some sandwiches. And they'd fix the sandwiches, hand them out a window and you'd pay for them, you know. I remember I came so, became so fed up with this until I was just out of Birmingham, Alabama, and I went to this ice cream place. It was hot. So I said, I'd like to get some ice cream for the band, you know. So I got this ice cream, and the uh, lady took the money. So I'm still standing there. She said, you want something else? I says, no, I'm standing here to see if you have a separate register for this black money. And I realized where I was. I said, I'd better, I'd better make it on back to the car. we better make some tracks. <laughs> but, you know, you, you run, uh, pretty soon your cup just, that last drop runs it over, and then you react, you know. And you really don't know what your reaction is going to be. And black music comes from experiences, black the black experience, you know, from the time they were brought here, on, and they, what they're singing about is what they live, you know. It didn't always have the blues farm. It uh, had the spiritual farm, you know. But the blues farm worked in there some kind of way, and it was 12 bars, and it wasn't but three chords. So it just kind of worked in. And it stuck because it was just a natural thing, you know, see. And, uh, and it had a great influence on all American music because uh, it's folk music, you know. Even your hillbilly music has an influence on American music because it's folk music, 
you can't get away from folk music. What the folks, what comes out of the folks, you know? <laughs> Naturally, see, it just becomes a part. And uh, so blues has become a part of American music and uh, Blackie Elvis Presley and all these guys, if you listen to their music, it's mostly the blues farm, this 12 bar thing, you know? Don't step on my blue suede shoe, but it's a blues. See, it's fast, but it's still a blues. Blues doesn't always have to be slow. You can sing blues, they can be happy blues, and still be the 12-bar blues, see? And most of my blues are not slow blues. Now, my brother, he did slow blues. He felt that type blues. But my blues are uh, fast. I feel a fast, rhythmic type thing. Well, the rhythm comes out of Africa, you know. Before they were even into mel melodies, they were into rhythm on these drums and so forth, you know. Well, it's infectious, you know. It's something like you catch it, you know. Something like smallpox, you know, <laughs> or the mumps. You just catch it, see. You can't resist it. It's, you know, it's just infectious. And uh, music is that way. Music is infectious. And if you got something that is uh, as basic as that was, which coming right from a culture of where the blues was born, it's got to be infectious. And it just grabs you, you know. When Fats Domino came out, they started calling his music uh, rock and roll. But I think what they were really doing was getting away from the name rhythm and blues, see? And uh, because they were playing the same thing, you know? They were playing the same thing with the same 12-bar music, just changed the name. Young, young kid, different group of kids come along, so they got to give them something new, so they change the name, you know? And about every 10 years or so, they change the name. Are they bringing another name? If they still call it rhythm and blues, it might have sold just as many records, you know. But get this, we got this new music now. Rock and roll, you know. And you listen to it, it's the same thing. But they call it rock and roll, see.